today I was texting with my buddy Andrew. You know him. He's the guy that was that has the um, CNC machine. I've done some videos on, uh, and he was uh, telling me we you know we've talked about this in the past. Setting up some sort of sensor in my garage to detect whether the garage door is open or closed. And he texted me. He said, "Oh, you should put some sort of magnetic switch in there to detect when the door is open and closed." And I do actually have one magnetic switch somewhere. I said, "No, I probably wouldn't use that because you have to be like physically that magnetic switch has to be." physically really close, pretty much touching, you know, within, you know, a quarter of an inch. Uh, if I was going to do something, I'd either use a, a sonar sensor that detects distance or just a motion sensor that detects if the door is moving, which I have a drawer full of both of these as well. Hook that to a something like a um, ESP8266 and it can send a signal, you know, to my computer, my server, whatever, and alert me uh, or just acknowledge or even just log when the door is opened or closed. And I said, but you know what? I probably don't even have to do that. I actually have one of uh, my IP cameras out there. So uh, when my daughter was smaller, I had a camera in her room, uh, kind of like a baby monitor. She got older and, you know, privacy. We took the camera out. So I just set it up in the garage. So that way I can look in my garage and I can see if the door is open if I want. But what if I want to uh, get an alert? Maybe I'm on vacation or just not home. I want an alert whenever the door is open. Um, let me show you this. This is a command right here. Uh, basically, it's it's a it's a Linux computer. I've shown it before. It's a little IP camera made by Wansview or something like that. Some Chinese company. I've got two of them. Uh, this particular one I can even Telnet into and get a root shell. Uh, but it's all th done through a web interface. And uh, I went to the web interface, opened up my developer console, my browser, you know, and uh, clicked. So the camera has IR LEDs. So when the lights turn off, it automatically when it gets dark enough, the LEDs turn on. And that way you have night vision on the camera. So I said to him, I said, I, I don't really need to hook up a sensor because my garage is dark when I'm not out there. So I can just detect when things get light, which is either someone goes out there and turns on the light switch, which if I'm not home, shouldn't be happening. If someone opens the garage door, now they're letting in the sunlight, those IRs are going to turn off. Or even if it's nighttime, if someone tries to open the garage door, uh, at least you know, using the motor, the light for the, the motor is going to go on and, you know, you know, the light in your garage turns on for a minute or two when you open the garage door. Now, if someone probably opened the garage during the night, it may not detect, but in general, I should be able to detect when those IR lights come on and then I know that something's happening in my garage most of the time. So I just said, you know, I should be able to get that. So I go into my web browser and there's a button so you can manually turn on the IR so I did that and I checked my developer console, saw what was being get, and you can see here that I changed obviously my username and password here, but I'm just using wget to pull the information. So get camera parameters.cgi, and it gives you a list of parameters. And it gives it to you, you know, um, line by line as like a JavaScript variable. Each one says var, the name of the variable equals whatever. And one of those variables is ircut, I'm assuming ir circuit. And it either gets a value of 0 or 1. So I'm taking, I'm grepping for that line, so I'm only getting that line. And then I'm going to use cut to, cr to cut everything uh, before the equal sign, which just gives me the 1 or 0, and then the trailing uh, semicolon, I use TR to remove that. So with this one line of code here, I'm able to uh, detect whether that IR is on or off. And of course, I can use this to check if there's a change in that. So I can set this to check regularly, and if I go away, if I'm not home, um, I can set that... If that value changes, do something. Either text me, email me, alert me, or, you know, for security things, I can have it unmute my computer, turn the speakers all the way up, and play an audio file that says, oh, tr intruder alert, intruder alert, stand down, please evacuate building, or something, you know? Which, if you're breaking into the building, all of a sudden you hear that, you, you know, that's probably scarier than an alarm going off, you know? You know, the police have been alerted. Um... But he recommend my friend Andrew, and I'm not criticizing him at all in this, just, just people do different things. He goes, I should set it up to work with Google Home, which I don't use Google Home or any of those things. And and it just, in my mind, and Andrew, you watch some of my videos, I'm not criticizing you here in that you do things how you want to do them. But why would I do that? He, he gave me a link to some open source project, good for him, that allows you to write software that interacts with Google Home. But I can tell you right now, that project alone is going to be a lot bigger then let's see, I'm using wget, grep, cut, and tr, all commands which are in BusyBox. Uh, so we're looking at one megabyte or less of software here that's already on all my systems, including the camera. 
technically I could have the camera be doing this itself. In fact, there might be some way to tell that into the machine and have the camera do all the checking. I don't even have to remotely check it from my computer. But here we have one line of code that checks it. And I'm going to say, you know, check that. If this value, I can check for a value, then do this, text me, alert me, whatever I want it to do. Or I can have it uh, check for a change. So it can be either anytime it's one, alert me, or if it changes from one to zero or zero to one, alert me. Um, but I'm doing this video because uh, a lot of things, oh, and, and so I also I have this whole command here, and of course that can be aliased or put in a script. So if I say chem IR, I believe is what I said to, there, it's giving me a zero. So I run that, and you can see how fast, it's, it's doing an HTTP request using wget and then running through grep, cut, and tr. Very simple, and if I manually change the IR, so I'm gonna turn it on now, the IR is on, I run it, you can see I get one. If I turn the IR off and run it again, I get a zero. So again, this is um, me manually changing it, but you can set it so, but by default action, is if it's bright out, the IRs turn off. When it gets dark, the IRs turn on. Very simple, very clean, you know, and works very well. Now, using a sensor like this on the door, again, will detect whether, you know, if it's the door moving, because again, this, this sensor with the IR, if someone turns on the light switch, it's detecting that too, which is a good thing, but it may not detect if someone pries open my garage door, uh, because that may not turn on lights if it's nighttime. I could do both. I could put one of these sensors out there too. Again, a motion sensor that detects the door moving. I just have to hook it up there. I mean, this was like $2 and an ESP826 is 2 or $3. We're so looking at $5. Uh, but then I would also have to hook up power to it, so another $3 for a cell phone charger, but I have to make sure there's an outlet there. Same thing with this, it detects distance, so it could be like, oh, you know, it's in front of the door, you know, it's so many millimeters, and all of a sudden, whoop, the number goes up, I can send an alert. But again, using the Google Home thing, it's like now I am relying on a larger suite of software. Uh, I am probably going to have to write more complex code than this one-liner of stuff. I'm now relying on Google services, I'm assuming, where here it's like all being done in-house and I can, you know, obviously if I want to look myself far away, I'm going to have to send myself a text so I'm relying on, but there's some, there's going to be some sort of communication there unless I have my own like tower <laughs> that sends out signals, which I'm pretty sure the uh, FCC would not like. Um, but I can use the internet to communicate with myself, but everything else, until there's an alert, everything's being done in-house with one line of code. Um, so that's just food for thought. Uh, and you see, I see a lot of people overcomplicating stuff. They, they try to think, oh, here's a Google service that's gonna make things easier. It doesn't get any easier than this. I'm literally running one, two, three, four, four commands piping from one to another that are all built into one executable, BusyBox, that's tiny, teeny, tiny. And it's, it's like, this is like first day I'm learning how to program type stuff. Where other things, again, you have to learn how to use that open source library of code, and you have to know the APIs for Google. I mean, I don't know how complex it gets, but it's going to be more complex than this. That's a promise. So don't overcomplicate stuff. A lot of the stuff out there that is used to make your life easier and to simplify stuff really complicates it a lot more than just doing it the basic way. And that's what companies want. Um, you know, I use... Google services. I have an Android phone and I use Google Fi for my cell phone service. You know, I use Google for a lot of stuff, but Google, Facebook, Apple, all these companies, they want you to think things are way more complex than they're supposed to be. So they give you these solutions that are supposed to make it simpler. And usually it's complicating it and it looks simpler because they give you some nice GUI interface, but it's actually more complex and it makes you think, oh, this is hard. I'm so glad I have this service and this software from this company and it simplifies it for me so that I can I can do this when in reality if you just take a few minutes to learn some basic commands you're going to have smaller file size again I'm running this command on my local machine but all these commands are built in BusyBox which are on the camera already so the camera could be checking itself and then send a signal out so I don't even have to do it remotely I just did it this way because it was quicker you know and and again, there might, I might even have to use wget if I'm using it on the camera itself. But because the camera is running Linux and I have a root shell through Telnet on it, well, now I can do anything, you know, that the hardware can handle. 
Um, so think about that. Think about that when you're trying to decide what to do. It's like, is what you're doing something simple? And is it using more than a couple of megabytes? That's even getting kind of big to accomplish. If it's more than one or two megabytes to accomplish the task you're trying to accomplish, you may not be doing it the best way. Are you relying on external services? You may need to for what you're trying to do, but most of the time you don't. Most of the time if you're running Linux, you know, it's an apt get or uh, Pac-Man, whatever package manager you use to install some sort of service on your local machine that does everything. It's very, very easy to have your computer send an HTTP request somewhere or to send an email somewhere, which can emails can send text. I've talked about that before. If you have a cell phone, most likely you can send a, a text to it from your computer using email. It's usually your phone number at, and then depending on whatever service provider you use, the at is, you know, at AT and T MSS, blah, 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 or Google Fi, I think it's google.fi or something like that, dot com. You can look it up. There's a list of them online. Your phone number at whatever, and it will send you a text. And it usually gets there between five and 10 seconds. So as long as you don't mind a five second delay, you will get that text. Just like I talked about with my water pumps. Uh, I have my water pumps and I set up some ESP 8266s Those pumps run too long, it sends a signal to my phone. Every time they run, it sends a signal to my server and logs it. And oh, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned in a previous video, I did have a bad bladder valve. I was a little concerned about that. My pump was running in my tank, was running a, around 150 times a day. Every time I turn on the sink, it would run automatically and it shouldn't because I have a 20 gallon tank, so it should run for a while before the pump kicks on. I replaced the tank, it was obviously bad. Since then, we're looking at 20 to 50 times a day. So, you know, 50 on a heavy time, like if I'm watering the, the yard and stuff like that. But we went from 100, 150 on the high end to, to, you know, around 30 on average after replacing that tank. And one of the signals to me that the tank was going bad was the logs and the numbers going higher and higher and all of a sudden hitting these high numbers. It let me know for a couple of dollars and a couple simple commands like this. So we have talked long enough. I gave you examples on how this worked. I thank you for watching. Think about it. Keep your projects small. That's all I got to say.